Good morning. morning. Welcome to Unitarian Universalist Church West on this dreary December morning, made brighter by all the people in our community. We offer gratitude for the privilege of living and gathering on traditional territory inhabited at various times by the native peoples of the Seven Council Fire, Ho-Chunk, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Menominee, Peoria, and Miami Nations. So much of the history of this land has been erased or ignored. Those of us who are settlers and newcomers are beholden to learn that history and and engage in the work of reconciliation and reparation. As a welcoming congregation to gay, lesbian, transgendered, bisexual, and queer plus peoples, we continue to address ongoing homophobia, violence, and unfair legislation targeting them. As an anti-racist faith community, we also acknowledge that racism runs throughout our society and continues to lead to the violent deaths and oppressions of Jews, black, and indigenous peoples, and other people of color. May we engage in the struggle to dismantle white supremacy culture in our hearts and in our community and in our world. My name is Larry Hawley and I serve on the Board of Trustees and my pronouns are he and him. This congregation expands beyond these walls to those who are joining us virtually. Wherever you are right now, whatever your age or color, whatever your gender identity, whatever your chosen beliefs, whoever you love, you are welcome here. And I want to add, because I found this emotion wheel just in papers this week, um, when we try to be inclusive, I think we truly try to not see your outward physical body, but to understand and accept where you are in your emotions. And so we have the phrase, come as you are and leave inspired. And I would twist it a little to say, come as you are, whether mad, scared, joyful, powerful, peaceful, or sad, come as you are, and be inspired, I would switch a little bit to, and feel a lot of acceptance and a little bit of love. And our goal is that you feel a lot of acceptance and a lot of bit of love. And so everyone has all those emotions at different times, but by coming together, I think we can help each other. Our theme for December is the gift of mystery And today's topic, the mystery of community effervescence, is evident in the very fact of our gathering. I'm so pleased to be here in community this morning with each of you who also chose to make being together a priority. It matters that we make this choice over and over each week. Your presence improves the experience for others, just as their presence does for you. Let me point out a few things to help us settle in. Welcome newcomers and guests. You are invited to fill out the welcome side of the yellow form you received in your order of service, as well as visit the newcomers table in the coffee room, where you can ask questions and pick up information. And if you're online and you want to connect, please email us at visitor at uucw.org. This is a multi-generational community All ages are always welcome here in the sanctuary. There is a worship exploration table for those who can listen better if their hands are actively at work. After the story for all ages, children and youth are invited to go to their programming or remain here. Those of you joining us virtually are invited to participate later in sharing joys and concerns. And you can do that by texting something to Reverend Julie. Our weekly announcements are printed and included with your order of service. Take them home and refer to them throughout the week. All of the announcements are important for somebody here that's on a team or a committee. Please read through them and or take them home. Today I'd like to highlight a few. Phase two of our engagement campaign rolled out this week with a special e-news on Tuesday. This campaign is all about reimagining who we are and how we connect post-pandemic. 
You can learn all about it in the community room after the service. Just look for the table and they'll help you connect to Realm so that you can uh, make sure you're connected to Realm, because some aren't, but also fill out an interest and talents uh, profile. And you might like to join a small circle of folks to reflect on why this congregation matters. Reverend Julie invites you to a reflection salon with wine and cheese this Wednesday at 5 p.m. You need to RSVP, so check out that announcement, and I don't know the number. I, I trust you can find it. Also, announcement six is important. The deadline for bringing gifts for allies for teens in foster care is next Sunday, December 10th. Remember to take a tag from the tree by the front door, and that'll give you some ideas of what to buy. Next Sunday is our holiday music service. Always a marvelous service. And you don't want to miss that. Please come and experience the island of lost toys, Philharmonic. And then I get, uh, I get to just add my own uh, words. Uh, I've got my hands in different pots here. And so the engagement campaign is something we've been working on. So I really do hope you'll go to that table to sign up on Realm because it's a way we connect with each other. And also for any new members who joined in the last two years, uh, you've been invited to a luncheon after the service next Sunday. And so if we haven't reached you, because it includes friends and um, guests who become frequent guests, um, please connect with us, either through Vicki Vicky Banville, Ann Deal, or myself, Larry Hawley. That's all. Thank you, Larry. Take a breath. Breathe in all that is troubling you. Take it into your being and transform it. And breathe out peace. Breathe in all you'd like to set aside for our time together and breathe out presence. Our opening words are those of Tanya Marquez. Our lives intersect and intertwine. It is a wonder and mystery that our paths have crossed, that in the immensity of time, in the vastness of space, we coincide here. I am in awe at the ways in which our lives intersect and intertwine, at the beauty that we create when we gather. May our coming together make us more compassionate, more just, more caring, and more loving. May our hearts and minds be open to this offering, all that is offered here. I'm so glad you're here. Let us worship, let us marvel at the miracle of being here right now and the mystery that brought us together. And now we'll light our chalice. When Unitarian, it's not on, is it? When Unitarian Universalists gather, we light a chalice. If you're joining us online, we invite you to create a similar light there as your contribution to this communal sacred fire. Please join me in reading our chalice lighting words, words that have no attribution. May we be reminded here of our highest aspirations and inspired to bring our gifts of love and service to the altar of humanity. May we know once again that we are not isolated beings, but connected in mystery and miracle to the universe, to this community, and to each other. With these words, we light our chalice. So now let us sing. 
Please rise in body and or spirit to sing number 368. If this song happens to be new to you, notice that there's a high part and a low part, and feel free to choose what works best for you. Reuben will do the low part and I'll do the higher one. Now let us sing. Sing to the power of the sing, 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 sing. Now let us sing. Sing to the sing, power of the sing, 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 sing. Lift up your voice. Lift up your voice. Be not afraid. Be not afraid. Now let us sing, sing to the power of the faith within. Now let us sing. Sing to the power of the sing, sing. Now let us sing. Sing to the power of the sing, sing. Lift up your voice. Be not afraid. Be not afraid. Now let us sing to the power of the hope within. Now let us sing. Sing to the power of the life within. Now let us sing. Sing to the power of the love within. Lift up your voice. Be not afraid. Now let us sing to the power of the love within. Now let us sing. Sing to the power. morning. Hi, I'm Matt Umstadt, and my pronouns are he and him. Um, I do several things in the church, despite not being a member. Um, and um, I am a uh, youth advisor for the high school group, and today I'm going to be filling in for Dave Cicero and reading our story for all ages. If anybody wants to come up, I promise you it'll be a rousing tale. Any children want to come up and come closer so you can see the pictures a little better? Um, by all means, join in. Um, today, we are celebrating the energy that arises out of groups of people coming together. Um, I also will have a personal connection with this that I'll share at the end, a fun little story of my youth. Um, this story is called Hey Wall, and it's read with the permission of Simon and & Schuster, and it's written by Susan Verde, and uh, the art is from John Para. So, Hey Wall, and I'm a little bouncy, so I apologize in advance. I, I tend to move when I, when I read or speak. So, Hey Wall, you are big. A city block big, my city block. It's a big wall, right? Hey, wall. In the fall, James and I skateboard past you as fast as we can on the way home from school. And in the winter, the dirty snow piles up in front of you. Mm, no one shovels. Danny and her friends on the block build their snowmen on other sidewalks. Hmm. Hey, Wall, when we're inside with family, friends, and neighbors, there is love, there is joy. Can you smell what's cooking? We're eating together. Can you hear the stories that we share about the way things used to be? We're telling jokes, belly laughing. Real quick. Yeah, we know what belly laughing is. Can we do some belly laughing? <laughs> right? There we go. Perfect. Yes. Phenomenal. Can you, can you hear our music? We are salsa dancing. We are hip hopping. We are dizzy from spinning. We want to take it to the streets, but you, you don't dance, you don't laugh, you don't share your stories. Well, 
I have a plan to change that. I've got my pencil. I've got my paints. Ooh, I've got my dreams. James and, and Danny brought their sketches. Grandma Addie brings her memories. We've all brought our ideas and our imagination. We give you our blank and boring wall. One last look, and then we begin. I call to my family, my friends, my neighbors. We stand right in front of you, staring you down. You are our wall now. Up on ladders and way down low. Soon we have filled you with colors and creation, energy. Hey, wall. Looks a little different now, right? So, anybody know what it's called when you put a bunch of paintings on a wall? What is that called? Yeah. A mural. Ooh, I love that word. Anybody have another word for it? What happens if you do it on a wall that you don't own? <laughs> Graffiti, yes. So, in no way am I admitting culpability in this. But when I was in high school, me and a friend used to take the city bus all over town, and we would search for walls just like this. I have no artistic ability at all, but I have two eyes, four sometimes when I wear glasses. And I was the lookout while my friend created art. The funny thing is, you know what he does today? He designs art for labels and CDs that sell millions of records. He makes tons and tons of money doing the thing he loves, putting beauty into a world, into places where you don't normally find it. And I think that's a really important thing that we can understand for all of us, right? We can put beauty into the world in places that aren't expected. Blank walls in a staid church, right? We put beauty out into the world. And that is, I think, the best thing that you lovely folks can do and you lovely folks. So let me make sure I say the magic words right. All right. I now invite any volunteers to grab the RE lantern. Do you want to do it? Sure. Yeah, it's the lantern right up there. We're going to light the RE lantern by the flaming chalice. And while other people, if they want to stay with their parents, can return to their seats, please join me in singing our children's recessional. The lantern and me and any kids who are going to RE are going to head out and go to the sanctuary for today's activities. All right, so if you don't know the song, it's in the thing, but most of us know the song. So, as you go, may joy surround you. As you go, go in peace. Know our love is with Go. As you go, may joy surround you. As you go, go in peace. Know our love is with you always. As you go, as you go. I love that. <laughs> hmm. Let us now enter a time of quiet and reflection, time to consider what new worlds might be possible, a time to surrender to the mystery. These meditative words forged in the fire of our coming together were written by Gretchen Haley. What's going to happen? Will everything be okay? What can I do? In these days, we find ourselves too often stuck with these questions on repeat. What's going to happen? Will everything be OK? What can I do? We grasp at signs and markers, 
articles of news and analysis, Facebook memes and forwarded emails as if the new Zodiac capable of forecasting all that life may yet bring our way, as if we could prepare, as if life had ever made any promises of making sense or turning out the way that we want, that we had planned. as if we are not also actors in this still unfolding story. For this time, this hour, we gather to surrender to the mystery, to release ourselves from the needing to know, the yearning to have it already figured out, and also of the burden of believing we either have all the control or none. Here in our song and in our silence, our stories and our sharing, we make space for a new breath, a new healing, a new possibility to take root. That is courage, forged in the fire of our coming together and felt in the spirit that comes alive in this act of faith, that we believe still a new world is possible, and that we are creating it already, here and now. Every day and really every way we are called to create that new world, to act in faith by coming together, to make space for breath, for healing, for our stories. One of the ways we do this is to be vulnerable enough to show ourselves to each other. When you share, either in writing or by speaking aloud, it means that others can see you and hold you in their prayers or in the light or in their thoughts. It's a way to extend ourselves generously to one another, and perhaps a practice in courage and vulnerability in receiving that generosity of care. In a moment, you're going to be invited to come to share if you'd like. For you, those of you online, if you'd like, you're welcome to send me a text. And again, that number is... What you share aloud today is only for the ears of those gathered now. It won't be included in the posted video of the service. And what you share in writing, either via one of those yellow slips or the QR code, will be shared as you indicate, either in the e-news or with our lay pastoral care team or just with me. So if you'd like to share something aloud, please come here to the mic and um, um, I'll light a candle for you. If you wish to remain seated, um, one of the ushers could bring you a mic, so please raise your hands if you would like the mic brought to you. As I said, I'll light a candle, and after each sharing, I invite you all to respond with me. We hold you in love. So you can come now as you wish. I have several other candles to be lit today. Just checking my texts here. First, a candle of concern and gratitude requested by Jude Christensen. Um, she writes that after learning about a suspicious mass in her lung that showed up in a cardiac calcium test, and after some additional testing, it is still inconclusive which is actually giving her hope that it's benign. There are more tests to come, and she expresses gratitude for the lessons in letting go of having immediate answers. Please send healing thoughts to her and her healthcare team. And I light a candle for 
um, Dave Cicero, who is in California now, his father-in-law's memorial uh, service for his wife Leanne's father was yesterday. And so this is for them as they continue that journey with Leanne's family. And also I'd like to light a candle for Vicki Vicky Banville, our church administrator, who um, has been out this week with COVID. Uh, we hope that she's back tomorrow or Tuesday, um, but get well, Vicki. And I, I have a lot of candles today. Some of you could fill them in if you want, but I'm going to say a candle of lots of gratitude for this caring community. I mean, the way that y'all showed up for the Carmichael Grandstand uh, memorial service yesterday was, it just fills me with awe and gratitude. Um, you honored the family so much with your gifts of presence and food and service. And a real special thanks to Kelly and Miles for just a ton of extra hours of support and to Ruben for the incredibly be beautiful music. It was quite a day. And that followed right on the heels of um, our youth group sleepover on Friday night. So here's a candle to them and all of their advisors. Um, I think there were 15 youth um, here for a sleepover on Friday night, and so they had a rockin' good time. And it's great that they were here. <laughs> The church has seen a lot of changeover in the last 48 hours, um, so it's great. Oh, and I'm just going to name a couple of um, things going on um, just on the calendar. Just a reminder that December 1st, which was Friday, was World AIDS Day. And just a reminder that there's uh, always an uh, ongoing struggle to end HIV-related stigma and illness. Um, it's also an opportunity to honor all those that we've lost, all those that we've lost to that awful disease. And we'll continue working toward a day when it's no longer a threat. And interestingly enough, um, a can there was an uh, International Day of Solidarity for the Palestinian people on November 29th. And then starting this coming week, Hanukkah begins. And all of that lifts up the tension in the Middle East, the ongoing tension, the centuries-long tension, and all of the people who are hurting, the Jews, the Palestinians, Christians, Muslims, Arabs, Israelis. Um, and that there may be come, come a time when there is war no more. <laughs> and for the Global Climate Summit, started this week in Dubai, uh, may we hear that advice, hear those recommendations, and make the changes that are needed. And online folks, this candle's for you. We know you're out there. We hold you in love. And one final candle for all that remains unspoken. Our lives hold so many worlds. And I know that there's much going on in your lives and in your interior lives. This candle is for you. May you be held in loving embrace. In a moment, we're going to sing again. But let's spend a few moments in silence. After the silence, you may remain seated or rise if you wish. We're going to sing number 83, Winds Be Still, at that time. But first, some time in stillness and silence.
Good morning. I'm Scott Kapischke. My pronouns are he and his. I'd like to share with you inspirations from the UUA Article 2 proposal. The gift of mystery. Unitarian Universalism is a faith that draws upon a wide variety of sources for inspiration and guidance. Currently, we articulate this in a list of six sources, which begins with the acknowledgement of our personal experiences of transcending mystery and wonder. Assuming that the Article II proposal is accepted at June's General Assembly, our inspirations will be articulated in a paragraph. I invite you to read those words with me responsively. The text is in the order of service. Direct experiences of transcending mystery and wonder are primary sources of Unitarian Universalist inspiration. These experiences open our hearts, renew our spirits, and transform our lives. We draw upon and are inspired by sacred, secular, and scientific understandings that help us make meaning and live into our values. <coughs> in ordinary, difficult, and joyous times. We respect the histories, contexts, and cultures in which these sources were created and are currently practiced. Grateful for the experiences that move us, aware of the religious ancestries we inherit, and enlivened by the diversity which enriches our faith, we are called to ever deepen and expand our wisdom. Good morning. My name is Louise Verwert. 
and I'm going to do the reading, which will make more clear, I think, the term collective effervescence. We are grateful for the experiences that move us and expand our wisdom. One of those direct experiences of transcending mystery might be termed collective effervescence. Margaret John Janikowski founded something called the Sewing Machine Project in March 2005. They believe that everyone has the power to make the world a better place, so they share sewing machines, creating partnerships, strengthening community, and nurturing their creative spirit. This blog post that I'm going to read was written for the project in 2019. It goes, the room hums with machines and voices punctuating one another in a single story made of many stories, many voices. It's a sewing day. The women, a unique weave of cultures, share their skills and their lives with one another. While there is plenty of leaning in to assist with threading, to adjust a bobbin, to offer advice, there is a greater leaning in here. Conversations spin around every aspect of their lives, family, home, common struggles. Problems are discussed and often solved. More importantly, Voices are heard. Sewers know this. We know that when we sit down to sew together, there's an indescribable peace that comes with the community that is formed. A peace born of listening and being heard. I know that when my hands are busy at the machine, my mind is free to roam in every dimension and I'm often surprised at the knots in my thinking that loosen the rough spots that become smooth. Emile Durkheim coined the phrase collective effervescence in 1912, and Brene Brown brought it to my attention in her last book, Braving the Wilderness. The notion of connection, communal emotion, a sense of the sacred that happens when we are part of something bigger than ourselves is familiar. I smile when a feeling that I've had is put so beautifully into words. More recently, researchers used the term collective assembly to describe and measure these experiences. They found that the unique sense of community formed when coming together around something greater than ourselves contributes to a sense of meaning, increase positive affect, social connection, and decrease loneliness. I read this and I think, exactly. When we come together to sew, we create. Soft fabric moves beneath our hands, accompanied by the music of the machine's motion our minds calm, and focused in a unique meditation, we are able to raise our eyes and really see one another. We are able to listen to one another, looking into each other's faces. Looking to, into each other's faces, I was looking into your faces. <laughs> we are trying to. We are able to read expressions, to hear the emotions of our neighbors' words, and to know we are part of something greater than ourselves. We are part of a community, and the belonging is powerful and healing. That is collective effervescence. As you've already heard, our theme this month is the gift of mystery. And here's something that's really not much of a mystery. 
Did you know that every minister, it is said, only really has one sermon? <laughs> it's like there's some core message that we're each passionate about, believe in, yet don't yet fully understand, and that we keep returning to it in order to turn it over and over and look at it and explore it. And have you noticed that we do our darndest to fit it into every sermon that on the surface isn't about it at all? <laughs> Well, if you haven't figured it out, mine, my one sermon is about community. <laughs> um, its elusiveness, how critical it is to our well-being, its mystery, its ability to transform us. That's the only sermon I have, really. When I first became a minister, I created some personal stationery with a quote at the bottom margin from Susan Lieberman. By building relations, we create a source of love and personal pride and belonging that makes living in a chaotic world easier. Building relations, building community, I talk about it all the time, and still I haven't really got it figured out. I sure know the feeling of experiencing real, heartwarming, juicy community, but I don't know for sure how to create it and the mystery of that feeling. And so once again, I'm preaching my one sermon. You know, for some years, I was a big fan of Brene Brown, read all the books, watched all the TED Talks. I still think she's amazing. It's just that I think I fully digested her one sermon, <laughs> which is about being your authentic self and about being vulnerable enough to share that with the world. She has really important things to say. And yet I think we must allow that everyone's one sermon gets changed up a bit each time it's delivered. And in Brown's book, Braving the Wilderness, she wrote a brilliant chapter about community. She wrote about community, even though the subtitle of that book includes the words, the courage to stand alone. And there's a chapter about community. Go figure. <laughs> Anyway, I think that it was in the reading of that chapter that I first came upon the concept, much like the sower in the story that, um, Louise, that Louise shared. That's when I first came upon that concept of collective effervescence. That is, as mentioned in the reading, the phrase termed by Emile Durkheim in 1912, collective effervescence. How's that supposed to make you feel? Fizzy? <laughs> Bubbly? A little like drinking bromo seltzer? Collective effervescence. Now Durkheim used this phrase in his theory of religion in his 1912 volume, Elementary Forms of Religious Life. He thought that those rare occasions when the entire tribe or community gathers, particularly in religious ritual, well, those times become sacred. Because during those moments, the group communicates in the same thought and participates in the same action, which serves to unify them. You know, they're like on the same wavelength. They're singing from the same page. And then we come, because we are they, we come into close contact with one another, and a certain electricity is created and released which generates this high degree of collective emotional excitement, or even, in Durkheim's words, delirium. This impersonal extra-individual force, he believed, is a core element of religion because it transports us into a new ideal realm and lifts us up outside of ourselves to make us feel as if we're in contact with an extraordinary energy. Now, I don't know. Does that sound like it is to be like it, like how you feel when you come here? I don't know. It doesn't necessarily sound like our religion. You use are not particularly known for being emotive. <laughs> and yet, I'm here to testify to the fact that I have sometimes experienced collective or community effervescence here, even here. The beautiful Irish poet and author John O'Donohue said it this way, calling that kind of collective effervescence a ministry of presence. He said, only holiness will call people to listen now. And the work of holiness is not about perfection or niceness. It's about belonging, that sense of being in the presence 
And through the quality of that belonging, the mild magnetic of implicating others in the presence. This is not about forge, forging a relationship with a distant God, but about the realization that we already exist within God. Merging Durkheim and O'Donohue, perhaps we could call collective effervescence a magnetic and sacred sense of belonging to a whole, a sacred whole. Now, when Brene Brown tells of collective effervescence, she talks about it in a wholly different kind of way, and I mean wholly, W-H-O-L-L-Y. Here's what she wrote. A couple of years ago, I clicked on a tweet by TED owner and curator Chris Anderson that read, when football equals religion, spine-tingling Aussie rendition of you'll never walk alone. Well, that link took me to a YouTube video of 95,000 Australian fans of the Liverpool, the Liverpool Football Club gathered at the Melbourne Cricket Ground for a soccer match. For two minutes, I watched a stadium of Liverpool fans sway in unison as they sang the club's famous anthem, which is You'll Never Walk Alone, red scarves held high over their heads and tears streaming down many of their faces. And I was surprised to find myself fighting back my own tears. And based on the video's, ten, er, based on the video's six million views, you can be sure that it wasn't just Liverpool fans or even soccer fans that found themselves misty-eyed and covered in goosebumps." Unquote. So I went to YouTube and I found that video, now watched by over 10 million people. It was moving, although as someone who's not much of a sports fan, I didn't get those same goosebumps. <laughs> I was actually more moved and had a greater experience of collective effervescence here yesterday. We had our own you'll never walk alone moment. And it was a moment, a sacred moment. And we were all changed by that and by the experience of being together, showing up for one another. Now Durkheim suggested that during these kinds of experiences, our focus shifts from self to group. Brene Brown cites a group of researchers who found that such experience contribute to a life filled with a sense of meaning, increased positive affect, an increased sense of social connection, and a decreased sense of loneliness. Gathering together is so very important in this time of increasing social media. You know, while it is of itself a rather magical thing, our online connections, they can't take the place of real physical community where there is that opportunity to feel belonging, to connect with something bigger than ourselves, to feel joy, meaning, to even feel pain in the company of others. Touching one another, being face to face, looking into each other's eyes and even shaking hands, it's shown to lower cortisol levels and, de and release dopamine which reduces stress and gives us a bit of a chemical boost. Hook, line, and sinker. I believe that we need that chemical boost. And I also believe that this community, this church, can be that place of effervescence, of collective assembly for everybody here and for everybody out there who's longing to find a place to belong. A place where the simple act of coming together creates what I've heard called the secret sauce. And what's the recipe for that secret sauce? Here's a hint and a bit of a challenge. Durkheim speaks of the whole tribe, everyone. Now to me, that implies that at least some of the magic, some of that mystery becomes less likely to happen for every person who's not here. I've been wondering lately if when you make the decision to come on a Sunday morning, does it ever occur to you that your presence is necessary to improve the experience for everyone else? An empty sanctuary or RE classroom can be just as spiritless as an empty stadium. 
And just like the empty wall in today's story, transformation happens when everyone shows up and does their part and voila. And there's nothing like that feeling. When you show up, well, everything's better for everyone. There's more energy, more electricity, more community effervescence. So my challenge to you is to remind yourself every week that there are others who need you. They need you to show up. As O'Donohue said, each person has the, has the effect of a mild magnetic force drawing others into the experience of what he called the presence. Well, the mystery in all of this is, well, it's simply, I think, the mystery of being human. I don't know why we're so wired for connection and community. On a cellular level, I don't know why our chemical levels and our brain synapses and pathways change in the presence of others. I don't know why, given so many of its benefits, it can feel so risky to show up for that community. Or maybe I do. You know, being human means having to, every day, in some way, be vulnerable. There be dragons out there. Being alive means always playing something of a survival game, outwitting the wilderness, staying away from danger, protecting, others from, protecting ourselves from hurt. And it would be a lie to say that every time we're in company of others, we get high on community effervescence. We don't. Sometimes we get hurt, we feel ignored or excluded or maligned, and we get bored sometimes. We simply don't feel the magic. Even in well-intentioned communities with covenants and ethical guidelines, we can hurt one another. So it's not a mystery that after bad experiences in community, we choose to turn away or disengage. We might judge it all as bad or unimportant or turn to comfort in other forms. And in many cases to unfortunately experience loneliness as a result of those decisions. Yesterday, Oliver's brother said that the opposite of addiction isn't sobriety. He said the opposite of addiction is connection. So when we're not feeling connected, when we don't have the community we need, then we need to find ways to create it, you know, to turn that blank wall into a wall of color and beauty. You know, when I was a kid, we didn't really have money to regularly buy soda or pop, whatever you say. <laughs> we used to make our own fizzy water, mixing a little bit of vinegar and baking soda into our Kool-Aid. <laughs> it works. It's like little chemistry experiments. Not ideal, but we did get the bubbles, and we drank that Kool-Aid, <laughs> and we enjoyed it. You know, sometimes it just takes the right ingredients. And again, I quote Brene Brown, to seek out moments of collective joy and to show up for moments of collective pain, we have to be brave, we have to be vulnerable, we have to show up and put ourselves out there. When the singing starts and the dancing is underway, at the very least we need to tap our toes and hum along. When the tears fall and the hard story is shared, we have to show up and stay with the pain. As much as we value going it alone and as much as we sometimes gather for the wrong reasons in our hearts, we want to believe that despite our differences and despite the need to brave the wilderness, we don't always have to walk alone." Unquote. We don't. We don't have to walk alone. And frankly, it's not a mystery. I believe in my heart of hearts that despite it all, community effervescence requires some pretty simple ingredients. Knowing that your presence matters, then showing up bravely, repeatedly, with persistence, and doing what is yours to do, contributing what is yours to contribute. That's how we build the beloved community, a community that bubbles over with joy and meaning and belonging we can do it. Just drink the Kool-Aid. 
May it be so. Blessed be. Amen. Good morning again. Um, if you forgot, I'm Matt Umstadt, and my pronouns are he and him. Um, and I am overjoyed to introduce our Split the Play partner for this month. Um, this one's special because the youth group, which had their sleepover yesterday and Friday, um, chose to Split the Play partner. Um, on the recommendation of the YRUU, we have decided to support the Allies for Teens in Foster Care. And I would love to just wax poetic for like a year about this organization. But instead of that, so Kathy doesn't shoo me off, um, I am going to introduce somebody even better positioned to speak about this, um, Allison Byrne, the Executive Director. Good morning. I'm Allison Byrne, and my pronouns are she and her. And I am very grateful to be here this morning in this peaceful, lovely space. So thank you for welcoming me here. I can't think of a better message to tie in the mission of Allies for Teens in Foster Care than the message that we provided here today. Because unfortunately, about five years ago, I really discovered uh, a bunch of teenagers and a bunch of children without a sense of community here in Milwaukee. Um, Astra, my family, had our own foster care journey, being foster parents to a then eight-year-old who we had the good fortune after a year or two to adopt. I went to the social workers and I said, where are the teens in foster care in our community? We hear so much about this group, but, but where are they? And there are, all, there are hundreds of them all over Milwaukee County, but because they are so vulnerable, so poor, um, so uh, um, vulnerable to people in drug and tra sex trafficking and other areas, they are understandably in little pockets. And most of the children that Allies for Teens in Foster Care serve actually do not have any kind of foster parents or any other kind of legal guardians, but are wards of the state. And consequently, um, there are hundreds of these children in licensed group homes around Milwaukee County. And the wonderful adults trying to serve these children are also living, doing their best living um, in poverty and working very minimal wages as well. So Allies tries to serve as a bridge from communities who would like to help these teens in foster care get the goods and resources to these group homes here in Milwaukee County. And I will be out there to tell you more about this mission and more about what we do. But there is a tremendous gratitude for these teens and from the adults um, for your help and for your work. And I'd love to share a little bit more about that with you. Um, and thank you for your willingness to help us with our Christmas donation, which hopefully will contribute $50 in Target cards, bathroom supplies, socks, hats, gloves, and coats, and other goods to teens that a lot of them will have as one of the, the major things under their Christmas tree this year. Thank you. Your offering today will help support the Allies for Teens in Foster Care. If you are not present, or if you're online, um, you can go to the UCW website's Donate tab and select Split the Plate from the menu. You can text or mail your donation today using the information found right here. Uh, thank you for your generosity to this incredibly, incredibly important organization. We will now gratefully receive your offering.
we subscribe to Soul Matters, a theme-based UU resource. This reading was found in the December packet on mystery and was written, written by Louise Connor, who is an editor for The Ecological Disciple, an online resource for folks who look in awe and wonder at distant galaxies, microscopic particles, and everything in between, who recognize the strands that connect all things in a wondrous web of being, and are concerned with the ways we are pulling those strands apart. She wrote this. Sometimes, particularly in a holiday season, lists of things to think about and do can consume us. But there is an essential truth that when we remember it, isn't just one more thing to add to the list, but is a way of seeing what is around us in a different way. Much like turning the knob on a set of binoculars so that our view changes from a fuzzy mess to a clear picture of what we couldn't distinguish before. It isn't as if the turn of the knob produces the thing being seen. It was always there. We just needed some help in recognizing it for what it always was and is. Today and each day, there is mystery all around us. Mysteries of birth, mysteries of death, mysteries of friendship and love, Mysteries of individual snowflakes and fingerprints. Mysteries of another day past and another day beginning. Sometimes if we pause and make ourselves be still long enough to look and listen to something other than the clamoring courtiers vying for our attention in the antechambers of our attention, we can see the mystery that is present in everything around us. Sometimes the mystery elbows into our consciousness through a pool of light made by a full moon in a dark room. Sometimes it appears within an apology we had given up on hearing. Sometimes it comes from laughing so hard at a shared joke that we find ourselves in tears. I've encountered it sitting in an apartment lobby waiting for people to arrive so I could let them into a gathering. During the mundane task of waiting, it fell on me. The mystery that my life happened to coincide with these lives, that our lives should intersect, that I had the privilege of calling them friends. It was a way of seeing that was steeped in mystery and gratitude and it permanently changed my way of seeing the people I share my life with. When this happens, when we find ourselves gobsmacked by the wonder of what we have been given in this life and are able to see the people and things themselves rather than just the worry or concern we surround them with, the most essential thing we can do is to revel in them and say thank you. Let us welcome in the mystery. As you're well aware and reminded by much of today's music, the Christmas season is upon us, and today is the first day of Advent, a time of waiting. Our closing hymn is O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, which is an Advent carol. Emmanuel literally means God in us, and so it expresses a longing for the spirit to enter, and I think really to feel that community effervescence. As we sing, let's invite the mystery in. Please rise in body and our spirit, number 225, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Okay. 
remain standing for our closing words. Larry, if you'd go to the chalice to extinguish it in a moment. You know, I've suggested in the last, no, you can go to the chalice. <laughs> You'll extinguish it. <laughs> He's really followed instructions carefully. <laughs> so great. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I suggested in the last few weeks that you join hands for the benediction if it's comfortable for you. Perhaps you'll reach out to one another now. Maybe feel the magic of the connection. Maybe you'll even get some goosebumps. Let's say together a silent word of thanks for the mystery that surrounds us and lies within us, and also for today, everyone who made today possible, including Larry and Scott and Louise and our staff, our RE volunteers, Matt, and all the folks on our hospitality teams. I hope you can stay for coffee and conversation and be sure to envision that, visit that engagement challenge phase two table. So I'm gonna offer one of my favorite Mary Oliver poems as benediction after which Larry will extinguish our chalice. <laughs> <laughs> the poem is called Mysteries, Yes. Today we live with mysteries too marvelous to be understood how grass can be nourishing in the mouths of lambs, how rivers and stones are forever in allegiance with gravity while we ourselves dream of rising, how two hands touch and the bonds will never be broken, how people come from delight or the scars of damage to the comfort of a poem, let me keep my distance always from those who think they have the answers. Let me keep company always with those who say, look, and laugh in astonishment and bow their heads. May we be those people who say, look, and laugh in astonishment and bow our heads. Blessed be. Ashe. Amen.